Our scripture for this morning comes from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords, and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers, and overturned their tables. And those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. So as we read in our scripture today, we find Jesus acting in a way that is really not in keeping with what we're used to seeing from him. We are used to thinking about the turn your other cheek, Jesus. We're used to thinking about the humble healer of the broken. The one that is all powerful, yet does not hold his power over others. Well, that is not the Jesus that we find in our scripture today. Now, please don't get confused. This is the same person. This was not some other person that looked like Jesus and went into the temple and started to turn over the tables. So what is it that could have made Jesus this angry? Well, first and foremost, he tells us why he's so angry in the scripture. He is angry because the temple has been turned into a place of business. He is angry because the temple is supposed to be not just a holy place, but one of the most holy places. So how did this happen? How did the people of Israel allow the temple to become a place of business instead of a place for the glorification of God? Well, what happened was this. People began to find the easy way out when making their offerings at the temple. You see, in the past, the people would have raised their own animals and grown their own grain in order to bring them to the temple for their offerings to be made by the priests. They also would have not just raised one animal in order for them to have a sacrifice. They would have raised multiple animals for them to have a sacrifice. Why? Because what happens if you're on the way to the temple and the one calf that you've been raising dies? before you can take him to be sacrificed. You'd better have a backup ready to go. So as the people grew, of Israel grew wealthier, instead of raising their own animals for, or growing their own grain to take to the temple, they would rely on local farmers to do the work of growing these things for them. And they would make their pilgrimage to the temple, buy a calf from that local person, and then have it sacrificed by the priests. And so this is what attracted the animal sellers and the money changers into the temple. It became profitable to be a part of this temple selling business. So the majority of the people that were having animal sacrifice were no longer putting in the effort of raising the animal themselves. The people had found a way to remove their need to actually sacrifice something in their lives. They were no longer sacrificing their time their effort, or their own animal. And they still allowed themselves to technically follow the law of sacrificing by choosing someone else's animal. So how do we see parallels in our lives today? Well, first, let us think of worship. Now, there is always an inherent danger when a pastor asks the congregation 
to think about worship. It is as if the pastor is saying to the church members, what is it that you want to criticize about me and about the way that we worship together? However, I think it is of great importance for us to think about the ways that we are worshiping and what they mean to us. You see, the problem that had arisen in the temple is partially that the ritual of the temple, the sacrifices to God, had lost any meaning for the people of the temple. So has the ritual of worship lost its meaning? Do you find yourself coming to church and not being fed spiritually? If you do feel this way, I would first ask you, to look at how you're approaching worship. When we allow ourselves just to come to church on Sunday because that is what we are supposed to do, it is hard for us to get anything out of being here. We must prepare ourselves for worship. We need to be asking God to speak to us. We need to be imploring the Holy Spirit to be with us, to open our hearts and minds to the messages that God wants to put upon our hearts. Now, you may notice that prior to service starting, it may appear that I am pausing and praying before I begin. And you may have wondered, what is he doing? Well, I am praying, and that prayer is almost always something like this. God, allow me to be your vessel today. Allow your word to be spoken through me. Please let it touch the hearts and minds of the people here so that they may grow in their relationship with you. Please let me do this not for my glory, but for yours. Amen. And what I want more than anything each week is for you to be in a place in your life that allows you to hear the message that God has and wants you to hear. No matter what I may be saying or what the songs may be that week, I want the message to go to you. So how do we make this mistake of allowing our worship to lose meaning? Well, one of the things we do each week in worship together is we recite the words of the Lord's Prayer together. And I have to tell you, it is something that I absolutely love doing in the church. Taking the time, however brief, for all of us to raise up our voices together in unison to God is very moving for me. Although since I'm the one leading it now, I'm also concerned that I'm going to mess it up in some way. However, when we lift this prayer up, are you really thinking about what the words mean? Are you really considering what it is you're asking God to do for us? You see, when we don't consider what we are saying, when we don't feel the meaning behind it, then we are simply saying empty words. And brothers and sisters, we cannot allow this or any other prayer that we lift up to be just empty words. Now, if you look inward, and you find nothing that is causing you to take worship for granted, and then you look outward, and you find issue, especially with me, then I respectfully ask you to let me know. I can't guarantee that I can fix the problem, but I'm more than willing to listen to suggestions as to what the people of this church need so that we can worship in a way that is meaningful. The second thing that we must do is to make sure that we are not allowing ourselves to just take the easy path in our worship. So what do I mean? Well, it is this. Part of our worship to God is our repentance. And we must be willing to repent of our sins. Now, for a long time, we as Christians have allowed the idea of repentance to simply mean forgiveness. We have allowed ourselves to stop at just asking the Lord to forgive our sins. And while he will do this because we have Jesus to intercede for us, it is not the only thing that is required of us. The word repent in Hebrew actually means to turn about, to turn away, if you will. So for us, if we are to seek repentance for our sins, we are not only to confess them, 
to ask for the forgiveness, but we have to be willing to turn away from those sins as well. And if we are not doing so, then we are allowing ourselves the easy way out, just like the people of the temple did all those years ago. And I don't know about all of you, but I don't want to have Jesus, the one who is always interceding on my behalf with God, angry enough at me to come after me with cords and turning over my tables because I'm allowing myself the easy way out when it comes to repenting. Finally, I will close with this. If you have found yourself unable to worship God in your current place, if you can't feel the presence of God in the community that you are in, perhaps you need a new community. Now, I don't want you to be shocked by what I said there or mistake what I'm saying. I want all of you to be a part of this church. And I want it to be a place where you come every week to be fed spiritually. And I want it to be a community that loves and supports one another as we walk together with Christ. And I want our worship time together to feel, make you feel connected to God. I don't ever want it to feel as though it's become meaningless ritual for you. However, I want you to know that I love you enough as my brother and sister in Christ that if you do need to go elsewhere, I understand. You see, it is more important for you to have a place that encourages your worship, your connection with God, than it is for you to stay in a place that's lost its meaning for you. So brothers and sisters, let us not find ourselves in the same position as those money changers. Let us come together to worship our risen Savior in a way that is pleasing unto Him and in a way that is worthy of Him. Let us make sure each week we do the things that we need to so that we have not uh, so that our worship has not lost meaning for us so my challenges for you this week are think about how your worship how you worship god in this place and out of this place is it meaningful or has it become just routine for you what do you need to do in your life to change the situation so that you can grow closer to god and if, if there is anything that I as the pastor or we as a church family can do for you in order for you to help you on this journey, please, please reach out and ask. Amen.